Uh, good evening, everyone. I am uh, Councillor Ian, Ian Edwards, Leader of the Council and Chairman of Cabinet. A welcome to people who may be followers on uh, YouTube. There have been no members of the public present. We will dispense with the ordinary health and safety notices. Uh, other than I would just ask, please, colleagues, make sure your telephones are set to silent and your mobile devices. If we could go through the agenda, please. Agenda item one, Mark, apologies for absence. Chairman, we have apologies from Councillor John Riley. Thank you. Item two, declarations of interest in matters before this meeting. Are there any? Councillor Lavery. Uh, Leader, I am declaring non-pecuniary interest in item seven, the uh, Uxbridge bid report, as I'm a council appointed director of the bid. Thank you. Noted. Colleagues, we're to approve the minutes of the last meeting of the Cabinet, and they are in pages one to 16. Are they agreed? Agreed. agreed. And item four, this is to confirm that there are business items in both part one, the public meeting, and part two, the private meeting. And uh, let's come to that a little bit more when we come to agenda item 10, which is a new approach to try and increase our transparency of the items considered in part two. So if we can attend, please, to the main agenda items, and we will turn to agenda item five, the report the Family Living, the Family's Health and Wellbeing Select Committee. Uh, Councillor Cawthorne, if you'd like to come forward, please. And I invite you to present the findings of the Select Committee to Cabinet. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Well, good to be here. Um, so, on behalf of the Families, Health and Wellbeing Select Committee, I'm delighted to be back. Uh, wearing a slightly different hat these days to present the outputs and recommendations of this review. Uh, we have sought to examine England's existing offer of assisted living technologies, technology innovation, and potential opportunities to create a more tailored and beneficial service experience for our residents, enabling them to maintain independent lives with better outcomes and thereby supporting our health and well-being policy objectives. We met with a wide range of stakeholders, including different service providers, technology providers, and service users from different client groups. Our discussions were also informed by observations made at the site visit to Park View, one of our extra care settings, which took me back a bit to when we opened it in 2019, which incidentally has progressed very well indeed since then, I'm pleased to say. The committee was able to gain some very profound insights into the experiences and perspectives of people who most rely on assisted learning technology. As part of the review, a survey was sent to a variety of residents, including people already in receipt of services and parents and carers in receipt of direct payments. The survey identified areas that worked well, areas of opportunity, and how assistive living technology uh, could be developed in the future. The committee was very impressed by the candour of the officer team and the evident commitment to build on and apply existing good practice consistently across the range of relevant services. It's reassuring to be able to report that the existing free telecare line offer is very well regarded indeed by residents and families, but there does seem to be an opportunity to address the misconceptions about assistive living technology and build confidence around its wider rollout in that it is there to complement the totality of the support offer, not to replace it. Personally, I was disappointed that Brunel University hadn't got a relevant research programme which coincided with the time of this review. But we have a long history of productive collaboration with them which should be harnessed when there is an opportunity, we believe, as part of this wider work. For Cabinet's consideration, the Select Committee has put together a set of recommendations which include strengthening collaborative working, developing training, improving communications and the development of a strategy in the context of the Council's wider digitisation agenda. I would like to take this opportunity to thank those officers and witnesses who have been so generous with their time to assist the committee in its work and to commend them for their continued hard work, commitment in providing support, advice and services to the residents of this borough. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cawthorn. Councillor Palmer. Thank you, Leader, and uh, thank you, Councillor Cawthorn, for presenting the committee's Viewpoint. 
I would like to thank the committee for its work on this important service we provide to residents. Assisted Living Technologies, ALT, and our telecare line service provide alarm sensors and equipment as preventative tools to support residents, including those with dementia and disabilities, to live more independent lives. Taking into account the digital area, era, in fact, we now live in, this principle of assisted living can also include a wide range of smart home and other personal devices and can touch on many more people's lives to help them live well. I welcome the committee's broad information gathering as part of their review, which included a virtual reality headset session so committee members could get a real insight into how technology works. I also requested a session so I could experience a social care scene being brought to life in a really powerful way, and I have to say, really moving way. The results of the user survey are very important to me, as it shows we may need to look further at dispelling some of the myths around the use of such technologies. As the review has several far-reaching recommendations, officers have sought to elaborate on what they could potentially entail as shown in the table covering cabinet report. This gives you just some examples of the possible range of actions that could be taken forward as part of the committee's findings, our wider digital agenda, and through our work with external partners such as the Hillingdon Health and Care Partnership. Considering the very broad range of potential future activities on this matter, I am proposing to cabinet tonight to welcome the review report at this time and to note specific recommendations from the committee. This will allow both officers and I to fully consider the committee's recommendations and their implementations. As a vehicle to take all this exciting good work forward, I have commissioned officers to develop a pr practical action plan for the deliver delivery of ALT into the future. I will ensure officers report back to the select committee on how this action plan is progressing and being implemented so they can see how their review has been integral in shaping our future plans. I'd like to thank the committee, including all their witnesses, for the thorough review. Thank you, Leader. Thank you very much. And Councillor Cawthorn, uh, please take back my thanks to the committee for the work. Very important area uh, of, of review that you conducted here. Uh, assisted living uh, technologies are going to be a, a growing part of, I think, our future service provision. And as you say, this isn't about replacement. This isn't about enhancement of what we're doing at the moment. Um, and you rightly point out that Brunel are, are not as in, well engaged as they might be with this program uh, locally. And in, that was a matter that I raised uh, in my first meeting with the new Vice-Chancellor, uh, only a matter of some weeks back. They are keen to develop their health school, and um, part of that will be looking at how they can assist with later life uh, medicine and support, as well as uh, general medical and uh, health support. Um, so I do welcome the report. We will be progressing the recommendations uh, as advised by Councillor Palmer, and I very much hope that the committee will be keeping a watchful eye on this development and stretching our achievements because I, I believe technology will be running a lot faster than we might be inclined to move ourselves, and it is incumbent upon us to try and keep up with it. So thank you very much for your work, and please take those thanks back to, to your members. Colleagues, are the recommendation agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. Agenda item six. This is the uh, standards and quality of education in Hillingdon. Councillor O'Brien. Thank you, Leader. I would like to propose agenda item six, standards and quality in education in Hillingdon 2020-2021. As you can see from the date, this is a report that is, um, has already been presented and is generally for noting here this evening. It is also a statutory report. Uh, this annual report focuses primarily on the attainment, progress and achievement and outcomes for the previous academic year by indicating how our education system in the borough is performing. It is a significant report, however, once again due to the impact of COVID-19 has had on schools in the last, the last year's schools data is very limited and most of the data outcomes available in this report are from the academic year 2018-2019. And 
therefore this report is only providing contextual information. There is no data for early years or primary school age at all for this year. Uh, our early year settings remain 100% good or better being judged by Ofsted, which is above the London average, and the focus during 2020-2021 uh, was on improving outcomes for vulnerable two-year-olds during the pandemic by supporting settings with the highest number of these children attending um, and making sure as many children in these settings are school ready. The primary school settings data has not changed as the DfE withdrew its statutory assessments for Key Stage 1, which is infants, and Key Stage 2 juniors. Uh, their SAT measures were, were, not, um, were withdrawn. The priority for these settings are supporting schools with the appropriate use of catch-up funding with targeted support prioritised for the most disadvantaged cohorts. In the secondary settings, overall results at Key Stage 4 and the 16 to 19 year olds at Key Stage 5, last year's GCSEs and A-levels, they were awarded a teacher assessed grade, which was a model which was developed by Ofqual following on from the previous year who were using centre assessed grades. So this has for the past two years led to results being severely um, percentage uh, have, having raised several percentage points higher than the usual expectations making the assessment difficult to analyze and um, the pupil attainment data is not comparable from the previous years vocational qualifications also use these teacher assessed grades for units last year to calculate grades School place planning continues to be high on the Council's agenda, with primary and secondary enrolments continuing to reduce by 3% respectively over the past couple of years, creating reductions in PAN numbers, that's the pupil admission numbers, in, in schools. Despite this, transitional admissions into reception and Year 7 continue to be positive, with 3,664 um, places in primary and 3,607 in secondary and Hilling remain, Hillingdon remains top London borough in West London for allocating school places of choice. The report went to the Families Education and Wellbeing Select Committee in March whereby the change of format was welcomed along with a full discussion following the officer's presentation and on page 72 there are some comments on the Select Committee comments that were made at that meeting. Um, the recommendations are set out, oh, sorry, the recommendation is set out on page 71 of the Cabinet paper which is to note the key findings of this report. I therefore move. Thank you, Councillor O'Brien. Uh, having high quality schools is an essential part of any successful borough. And um, although this is a statutory report, it's not just here for noting. It does drive our, our thinking analysis and uh, planning moving forward. I'm, I'm very pleased to hear you comment on us being at the top of when it comes to school placements. And, and that is clear evidence of the investment this Council has been making over many, many years to ensure that we have the right number of school placements going forward. And I'm pleased that we will hear in the future in this meeting about our uh, investment in, in, in uh, children who, with special educational needs. Um, colleagues, is this report noted? Noted. Thank you. We move on, please, to agenda item 7, the Uxbridge Business Improvement District. Councillor Lavery. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, I renew my, my earlier declaration of non-pecuniary interest in this item. Uh, the original five-year term of the Uxbridge Business Improvement District, which is always known as Uxbridge Bid, um, expires this September. The Cabinet paper before you seeks authority for the required ballot of local businesses to grant the bid another five-year term and to allow the Council to vote in the ballot. The bid covers a defined area within Uxbridge Town Centre and provides additional services to business above those provided by the Council. It is financed by a levy on business rate payers within the district and an exemption for those with a rateable value below 15,000 and charities. In the last five years, the bid had an overall aim of making Uxbridge a better place to live, work and socialise. The first term has included the pandemic period, which needed additional measures to make the high street safer and then a programme of activities to encourage increased town centre footfall. And this certainly has been the focus of bid work in, in, in the latest period. 
The report details a range of measures that have been taken to improve the town centre, including security ambassadors, funding of police officer and floral displays, and these are in addition to the summer and Christmas promotional events. The business plan for the new term is included in the report from page 145 of the, of the Cabinet paper, and this forms the basis of the offer to businesses to secure their yes vote in the ballot. Uh, the broad themes for the next five-year term are a fun and vibrant community, a stronger community, a safer, cleaner environment, a greener, more vibrant high street. Uh, the bid does recognise um, the changing nature of, of the shopping centres and therefore the need um, to encourage more footfall into them and a, a wider diversity of uses and also the changing nature of office employment in Uxbridge um, where we have seen reductions in, in office space and that is likely to continue and what, more importantly where everyone isn't necessarily coming in every day so therefore again that puts pressure on the town centre businesses and the need to find ways to attract more people to come into Uxbridge Town Centre. The report has four recommendations on page uh, 136. Uh, I will move those now, and, and in case, if, but there may be other colleagues who wish to contribute. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Lavery. Uh, and I suppose on reflection uh, and noting in the recommendation that I will be voting on this, I suppose I should also declare the fact that I have a non pecuniary interest in this one as well. Uh, as I believe all Cabinet members will, because in, in some extent uh, we are an interested party in that we will be contributing financially towards it as a consequence of our engagement and membership. Uh, the Business Improvement District does uh, some fantastic work for, for uh, our, our town centre. We are not only interested in, it, in its success because it is our municipal town centre and as a council we want to see it flourish but we are also a, a member of the bid and we wish to see it successful. Colleagues, is this one agreed? Agreed. Oh, sorry. Councillor Th Douglas-Mills, you wish to come in. Sorry. Thank you, Leader. Um, yes, just to reinforce, having been involved at the outset in terms of talking to businesses about establishing the bid five years ago, um, I was delighted then when um, the decision was made by the businesses to, to set themselves up. And I think there's been lots of evidence where they have come together and made sure that Uxbridge gets the kind of recognition that is required. Uh, like everywhere else, the pandemic has um, been very uh, unfortunate in terms of timing and has knocked the bid back. Um, and I think we as a council not only need to agree to support it and pay our contribution, but we need to look at ways to be as very supportive as possible of the bid going forward. And I know Councillor Lavery is very aware of this in terms of encouraging leading members from within the bid community to step forward and take uh, increased responsibility and take advantage of what the bid can actually offer over the next five years. Because in five years' time, we want Archbridge to be seen not just as our premier town centre, but one that is thriving and where businesses are looking to relocate back to because there is a demand and there is an expectation that this will be an economic powerhouse within the borough. Thank you. It, 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 exactly uh, right in, in the importance of the business improvement district and the way we're moving forward. Colleagues, is that the recommendation agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Turn to our agenda item, yeah. mate. The Schools Capital Programme. Uh, Councillor Bianco. No, thank you, Leader. Um, uh, I wanted to have a small input under this because uh, the capital programme uh, and, and building uh, comes under my uh, brief. Uh, and uh, what this uh, report uh, demonstrates is our continued commitment to the investment uh, that we've been making over many years into uh, the provision of school places. Uh, many years ago, we made a commitment that no child in Hillingdon would end up with anything other than uh, an appropriate school place uh, in an appropriate establishment. And we have kept our word in that over many years, and we've invested a huge amount of money, uh, firstly in the secondary school expansion program that took place, uh, more than 150 million, and, and subsequently in the primary school um, program. Uh, and that has resulted in new schools, expanded schools, and improved facilities across the borough. And this, uh, this uh, update uh, just confirms that our, uh, that our commitment remains, uh, and indeed, uh, shows that we're proposing to spend 10.9 million uh, on maintaining uh, and investing 
in school places between now and 27, 2027. Um, uh, this is important to us. It's absolutely vital to our residents that their kids have school places, uh, and I'm sure that uh, my colleague, Councillor O'Brien, is going to say a lot more about other aspects of this report. Thank you. Councillor O'Brien. Uh, thank you, um, Leader, and thank you, Councillor Bianco, for the introduction. Uh, this report provides an update on the changing need for school places in Hillingdon, and more so the need for special educational need places. With the decline in requirement for primary school places and the continued reduction in PAN for some primary schools, this has opened up an avenue to repurpose spaces in some schools to the change in demand. Data is telling us that demand for mainstream secondary school places continues to rise until it flattens out and starts to dip after 2028, and there are currently two projects in the pipeline. Firstly, the rebuilding and expansion of Harlington School in the south of the borough, and secondly, currently still in the concept phase, is the Bishop Arden Free School that, uh, although sits in what would most call the north of the borough, but just north of the A40 and quite central ge geographically within Hillingdon. Both of these schools will have special educational needs spaces with some integration into the mainstream environment. I've often sat here and highlighted the growing demand for special needs places within the borough with it when referring to the dedicated schools grant, and for some time officers have been working with the vision of having more special education needs places within this borough itself. This paper shows the work that has been going on in the background for some time. On page 171, table one shows the Department for Education projects that have been agreed and funded by the DfE, and we now await the delivery. There has been some delay, obviously, due to COVID and, and other um, parameters, but um, we, we, we now know that Harlington School is, 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 has already started and, and it's phased in to, to be completed very soon. And on page 172, table 2 shows the proposed bids for future SEND capital with the number of additional SEND places, and we've already started to bring these projects to Cabinet for approval. Um, we brought Meadow um, in, in the March Cabinet, and we have ambitious completion dates for, for, for many, many of these projects. The Council will continue to bid for and invest in school places provision in the 2021 to 2027 schools capital programme, which was approved by Council in February 22. This included £10.9 million for continued investment in mainstream, and the future identified SEND programmes is estimated to cost just under £22 million and will deliver 394 additional places, which um, all tells you quite nicely in the report. So recommendations one and two are set out on page 170 of our paper, that's, and the cabinet, <coughs> there's an addendum um, sheet for item eight as well, and recommendation three is set out on there. Therefore, I would recommend that cabinet approve this paper. Thank you very much, Councillor O'Brien. Colleagues, are the three recommendations agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Item nine, the monthly council budget monitoring report with Councillor Goddard. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. This is the report of results for the year to date, as at the 28th of February 2022. The overall financial position of the Council continues to be one of no material adverse change and continuing strength and stability. There is up ahead in my report one material piece of good news that I will refer to a little later. The general fund revenue account under spend against budget amounts now to £521,000. This is an improvement to £24,000 on the month 10 equivalent position. General balances continue to be projected at £26.6 million as our year end, which is consistent with earlier months. Um, exceptional pressures arising on, on COVID-19 for 21-22 are now projected at £19.1 million, which is a reduction on the projected position as at month 10 amounting to £94,000. However, we do have agreed central government funding of £21 million, which is allocated to cover these, these pressures. And of course, in addition, we also retain earmarked reserves as previously reported. Our programme of savings for 21-22 is making good progress. Of the £10.4 million of savings budgeted for the year, £8.4 million are banked or are well progressed for delivery by the year end. 
and a further one million of this is in earlier stages of delivery. Turning to the piece of good news that I signalled previously, uh, we are now looking at a reduction of £15 million in our deficit for the de dedicated schools grant as at the 31st of March 2022. So to be clear about this, uh, whilst uh, a figure of £38 million has been reported in this respect in previous months, we now know that this, this deficit will be reduced to £23 million. And that is very much as a result of the uh, safety valve agreement which was entered into with the Department for Education. Um, and the largest element within this reduction is a repayment of some of the investment uh, which we have made supporting special educational needs children, uh, which the Department of Education have returned to us. The other point that I'd like to emphasize about this agreement um, is that it does not uh, require us to invest further money in order to deal with the deficit. Um, so we are on a progressive program of reductions uh, which will see this deficit eliminated uh, by 2025. Turning to the housing revenue account, this continues to report a close adherence to budget with a forecast surplus of £147,000, being a £5,000 improvement on the position reported at month 10. Um, in terms of recommendations, therefore, I move recommendation 1, which is in, within part A of the report set out on page 180. Part B of the report on page 204 of the pack sets out a number of recommendations itemised 2A to 2H. The vast majority of these are self-explanatory. However, I would like to draw colleagues' attention to the following items. First of all, item 2G, which is the Council's Energy Rebate Discretionary Scheme, which allocates further grants to residents with homes which are categorised in bands E to H for Council tax purposes and who are suffering financial hardship. So there are additional funds allocated to them in this respect. And secondly, item 2H, uh, which deals with a revised charging structure for fees to be charged by the imported food service. Uh, as colleagues will probably be aware, it has been necessary to make a number of changes to the staffing structure uh, within this service, largely as a result of the consequences of Brexit. And therefore, these charging structures are designed to bring the operations of that unit back into equilibrium. So therefore, I move the recommendations 2A to 2H, as well as those in respect of Part A. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Goddard. It, it is very clear from the report here that the uh, false lines being put around about this council being close to bankruptcy are, are absolutely not true. With, with a £512,000 underspend this year, with sound balances, uh, with sound earmarked balances, and now with a very secure and strong agreement from government that brings in substantial further investment into our schools, uh, we can clearly show uh, that um, those stories to be, uh, let, let, let me be generous and say uh, misguided. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I won't, won't say anything stronger in, in, in this forum. Uh, colleagues, are the recommendations agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item 10 uh, is a, a, an initiative to bring into better public view matters that ordinarily we consider in private. I believe it is good governance that we are as transparent in our decision making as possible and very often items that are sit within part two have very significant public interest but are hidden from that view because of the nature of the reports. We are doing our best to separate the information that we can make public uh, from that that we must retain confidential uh, owing to the co commercial nature of it. So agenda item 10 is a synopsis of all of the rep reports within part two bringing to public attention those matters that we can bring to your attention. And, and colleagues, I, I understand that Cabinet members do wish to speak on a couple of these items to the extent that they are able to within the public part of this meeting. Uh, Councillor Palmer, you wish to speak on one of the items. Thank you, Leader. And um, I'm really hoping that members of the public are watching tonight because 
this is a moment when I'm proud and pleased to be able to introduce something that normally would be hidden under part two and it is going to be in part two but I am absolutely over the moon if I can use those words to be able to talk about it tonight in a, in a short way. So this is going to be, um, we're going to be talking later about a contract but this is for a mental health crisis house and this is work that we're doing very much with our health partners to support residents who have a mental health crisis, to be support them in the community rather than a hospital setting. So this should aid recovery and help reduce the likelihood of future crises, especially in the pandemic. People's mental health has um, not been as balanced as as people would like and nobody really wants to go into a, a hospital if it's avoidable so what we're proposing here is a crisis house as part of our mental health crisis pathway and it will allow people with mental health needs to manage their crisis in a non-clinical homely setting in the least restrictive environment possible there is a proposal for a 24-7 service with a length of stay of up to seven days and this in, in enables people experiencing that mental health crisis to be supported in the community and give them a better chance of recovery. Also it's a pilot project and it's anticipated to provide consequential savings for the NHS and social care as previous pilots in other local authority areas have de demonstrated and depending on its success in supporting those with mental health needs there's a proposed option for a, for a 12 month extension. So this is a really really exciting piece of work that Hillingdon Council and its health colleagues should be very very proud of and I'm so proud to be part of this and can't wait to see how it develops out for uh, residents um, unfortunately experiencing mental health uh, crises. So that is what I will be talking about a bit later but I am really hoping that this gets some publicity because once again it is about a council going forward rather than sitting standing still and not dealing with residents who have mental health needs. Thank you Leader. Thank you very much Councillor Palmer. Your, your passion for the subject comes through powerfully. Uh, and it is absolutely right that we do as the level best we can to help all of our residents at different stages of need throughout their life's journey. And this is exactly what we as a Conservative administration are committed to doing. And I'm very pleased that we're able to bring a little bit of light to that by uh, reporting it in, in this agenda item 10. Councillor Bianco, you wish to also comment. Yeah, thank you, Leader. Um, I'll be brief, and, and, and I think it's just worth touching on because these are two important contracts. Again, they, they show what we're up to that, 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 generally speaking, the public don't see unless they're intimately involved with it. Uh, and the first is, is, is that we, we're shortly going to uh, um, agree uh, to uh, contracts for electrical testing repairs and upgrades. Now, that doesn't sound very exciting. Uh, but it is in respect of more than 10,000 properties that we own, uh, well, significantly more than 10,000 properties we own. Uh, the largest amount in excess of 10,000 are, of course, homes uh, for our residents. And, and, and this is our continued commitment to ensure that those homes comply with legislation and are safe and suitably uh, uh, provided for, for our residents to, to live in safely. The second item that I just wanted to touch on is, is again we're going to grant contract extensions for existing contractors um, uh, who work with us providing um, adaptation works on, under the Disabled Facilities Grants. Uh, we invest significant amounts of money each and every year uh, providing, ad well, working out, working through, working with people and providing um, adaptations to people's properties both in the private sector and council properties um, uh, to make uh, their homes uh, suitable uh, and, and so that they can retain their independence uh, for longer. Uh, and that might be from uh, provision of wet rooms uh, to stair lifts or, or whatever else that might be needed. Um, and this is an extension of that contract. So it's again a commitment to our residents uh, that we are continuing to work for their benefit. Thank you, Leader. Thank you. And for the completeness of the record, the 
another last item on the part two agenda item is, uh, would have been introduced by Councillor Riley, who, who is not with us this evening. Uh, this is effectively, uh, it is a straightforward contractual matter of us purchasing services where it is better for us to be going to the market rather than employing uh, the experts within the house. So this is just part of our normal efficient operation of the council and securing best value for our residents. Uh, colleagues, uh, I take it agenda item 10 is noted and members of the public, uh, I hope that you find that of value and should any of you be minded to give feedback that would be gratefully received from Democratic Services about whether or not this in initiative is of value to you and how we might improve it further. Is that, is that paper noted? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're now going to go to part two. Thank you.